Hello. Um, first of all, thanks for thanks for having me here today. Um, really pleased to be invited along to talk. Um, you can see on the, the agenda actually that it says that I'm, I'm here to talk just about OS Open Zoom Stack. Um, but once I saw the synopsis for the event, I thought I'd tweak that slightly, hopefully to make it a bit more interesting to the audience that we've got here today. So I'm going to talk more generically about <coughs> um, geodata visualization at Ultimate Survey, and I will still talk about Open Zoom Stack as we get towards the end. So yeah, I'm Charlie Glynn, I work in the Geodata Viz team um, at Ordnance Survey based down in Southampton. Very apt that we're in Southampton Street today. I've travelled from one Southampton to the other. Um, as I say, yeah, thanks for having me. Let's crack on. So I'm going to talk briefly about a yeah, very brief introduction of cartography, what cartography means, how we can use it as a, as a storytelling medium. Um, talk about the work that, that I do and that we do within the GeoDataVis team at Ordnance Survey and then talk about some of the projects that we've worked on over the last couple of, couple of years as examples of maps um, in use and how they can have very diverse um, uses, not just you know, being Ordnance Survey. Most people know us for the orange and purple maps that you find in Cotswolds or WH Smiths, um, the maps that people used to go out and walk mountains and cycle rides. But the work that I do in my team at Ordnance Survey um, hopefully can show through these examples today that maps can be many things and we can use them in many different ways, many different forms. So cartography, um, what is it? So my favourite definition <coughs> is this one, which you'll probably find on Wikipedia. Um, it's just really short and simple says that cartography is the art and science of map making and certainly in my 15 odd years of experience in being a cartographer um, certainly rings true. So maps are one of the earliest known forms of data visualisation. Um, they seem to be integral to human history ever since people were scribing on cave walls. Um, we find examples of, of mapping seems to be something innate within us as humans, this desire to understand the world around us and contextualise ourselves within that space, within that world. And we actually find it very hard um, not to see things spatially. So it's something that is kind of within all of us really. Um, one of the earliest known maps of the world um, was an old Babylonian map, many, many uh, centuries old. Um, and as I say, yeah, it's just really interesting to see that, that humans throughout all the time have been trying to understand what, uh, more, more about the world around us. <clears throat> so jumping forward to more, more recent times, um, this is a famous example. So hands up if you've seen this, this example. Anyone living in London may be aware of the, the hub and the, the water pump that sort of exists um, still to this day. A famous story of Jon Snow. Uh, the doctor who, during the cholera outbreak, was trying to figure out um, the cause of that, that cholera. Um, and through various uh, forms of statistical analysis, and the, the map, I guess, kind of became the hero for um, that analysis. Um, they managed to identify that it was this individual water pump um, that was the, the sole kind of cause of the, of the spread of this cholera. So this is one of the earliest examples of maps being used for kind of statistical analysis um, for displaying this information. Obviously in this case a medical um, use case and kind of the start of, of what we now call GIS, Geographical Information Systems. Trying to use geospatial data and information to learn more about the world around us. I was going to talk about this one. <laughs> we all know about this one now. I might have done such a good job of telling a story around this. So I'll skip this. But much like the John Snow one, it still um, rings true today. It's such a great example of, of mapping being used. Um, you know, in this instance, to tell, tell stories and actually portray many different types of information in one map. So, cartography today. I mean, maps are everywhere. I mean, 
a lot of us in this room today have probably got maps on our walls or maps on a cushion cover or something like that. We've certainly all got them on our mobile phones. Um, the typical apps like Google and Apple Maps, which we use to navigate from A to B. Um, but also geospatial data has been used in the large majority of, of applications that are on our mobile devices, whether that's to bring us news that's local to us or to make the information that they're showing you personal to you um, based on your location. More and more people are making maps today than, than ever have before. Um, we see that lots of disciplines over the last decade or so have converged. Um, things like data journalism, people making much more use of maps in the media to tell stories. Um, and where a map maybe previously would have just been a small um, figure to a story, we now see map-led stories. Um, and yeah, as I say, they're ubiquitous, they're all around us. Um, and we have lots more people um, because the data and the software has become much more accessible. So, to introduce the team that I'm working with called GeodataViz, formerly Cartographic Design, and it's our job to make sense of data through the use of, of vision maps, largely. So we do a, a series of things. We develop, uh, design and develop new products. We help tell stories. We help our marketing teams and our um, press teams um, use data to tell stories. Um, and we support our customers and partners. So one of our roles is to go around the country and give uh, workshops, showing people how to make better maps, how to use ordnance survey data. And we craft lots and lots of um, bespoke, unique um, cartography, unique maps. So as a way to introduce some of the work, I just thought I'd show some, some visual examples. This is a map that I made uh, a few years ago. Ordnance Survey was celebrating their 225th anniversary. Um, they had a really nice opportunity to dive through the, the archives of Ordnance Survey maps, choose a couple of our favorites, and use modern data and modern software to recreate those maps. And this is one that I chose to recreate. It's from 1967, this gorgeous map of the Western Highlands up in Scotland. Um, a colleague of mine also did an old vintage map of, of London. That's a really nice way of showing how we can recreate these old styles <coughs> with modern data. Uh, so maps aren't always functional. As I've spoken about those kind of explorer maps that Ordnance Survey are well known for, they're very functional in the sense that they're to help people um, <coughs> do their, their outdoor activities, to find the closest pub, to find the local toilets, to find various facilities that have a real um, function functional use, but maps work along a whole spectrum of different use cases, from the very functional to the very kind of artistic at the other end of that spectrum, the very creative and often abstract, and this is kind of one that's further along that side of the, of the spectrum for sure. Um, so this one came in to us via our marketing team, our press team, sorry. Um, there's a composer based in London called Ewan Campbell. And he makes, he composes music, classical music, um, often through different visual forms. And in this particular one, he's been taking screenshots of Ordnance Survey maps and hand drawing over five of the contours and following those round in a loop. And they became his five musical staves onto which he would compose his music. So he got in touch about this to see whether we'd like to collaborate on, on some of his um, compositions. Uh, to me, this was really great because I think there's a real good synergy between music and cartography. So I was really pleased to work on this. We've done um, two maps like this one since. And this particular one is based on Arthur C in Edinburgh. Um, and we also did one on a place called Glyndebourne. Um, yeah, so that was really good fun. I think that shows you know, the vast difference between the types of maps that we'd normally expect to see from Ormond Survey, certainly. Um, another project that we worked on not too long ago where we collaborated with the University of Sheffield and sitting behind this map, you know, it's a, it was an A0 poster by the end of it, so a nice big kind of pretty poster for people to put up on their walls. But actually behind this map is, is quite a lot of data and a lot of analysis that went into it. So the data is really um, 
high resolution um, terrain data of Great Britain. Um, we had to first find all those islands off of the mainland of Great Britain that were over five kilometers squared. So immediately we're doing analysis based on the, the size of those um, islands. And then we, we ran analysis on how many um, residential addresses were on each, the size of each, the length of the coast, and the highest point on each. And we told a story through our, through our blog around these islands. And since releasing this, um, university, it helped the University of Sheffield um, raise some funds for their students. They sold the poster itself in their shop. Um, there's a lady uh, called Katie Tun, I believe, who has been inspired by this particular poster, and she's now visiting each of those 82 uh, islands, which is really cool. And then another part of our role is um, just to kind of create maps and visualizations that showcase the kind of the art of the possible, I suppose, and, and what can be achieved with uh, geographic data. Um, and this is, we have a new product coming out really soon. It's like a two meter resolution um, digital terrain model for the whole of Great Britain. It's really high, highly detailed information and we just get the fun job of just being able to create really nice visuals to showcase the art of the possible um, for some of our customers and our, and our end users. So now moving on to a few more um, projects that I'll talk about each one in a little bit more detail, a bit about some of the tools and the techniques that went into into creating these. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is OS Maps. OS Maps is our, um, it's a web and mobile application for outdoor leisure use, uh, which was launched a few years ago. Um, and at the time, uh, we were the cartographic um, design team, and I was invited to join the UX and um, UI design team and work alongside, uh, work alongside those guys to develop a new uh, base map, basically. Um, which was aimed largely at trying to onboard some new users. So the aim of this um, particular task was to create a nice topographic map and kind of marry up some of the, um, the aesthetics that you'd find in a traditional ordnance survey map with those of what a, a kind of new user might be familiar with. But, you know, when they're pulling up a map on their phone, it's more than likely going to be a Google or an Apple map. So the job there was to try and marry up the, these two aesthetics between the simplicity and the complexity. Um, and also working alongside those UI designers was to make sure that the map worked kind of harmoniously with the, the user interface that was built around it. And then a couple of years after um, launching that application, we were collecting data around people's routes. So these are routes where people have been out walking or cycling, and they're routes that they've either tapped on their screen by clicking on the map, or they've actually um, GPS traced using their mobile device. So in the back end of this system, we had a large database. I think first time we ran the analysis, we had about um, half a million routes. Um, and we thought, uh, we've got a, a database sat there, lots of information within it. Let's see what we can do. If we analyse those routes, can we find out the most popular places in the country where people like to go out walking? So we broke down the country into one kilometre grid squares and took a count of routes in each of those squares and created a top 20 list. Um, and it was my role in this particular thing to work alongside um, the data scientists who've done the analysis and to then help portray the, the results. So we created a, a, a nice bunch of um, graphics to, to help present that information. It's the poster that you see on the left. Um, this is just like half a million routes. There's no topographic data at all on that on that poster there. And then we did some more kind of zoomed in maps to show the detail of that information. But what made this one um, particularly kind of successful, uh, marketing team launched the story and it was picked up by news outlets all over the country because we did these individual kind of zoomed in snippets that made this data personal to the, to the audience. The first thing you do if you show somebody a map is they zoom right into where they live. They want to know what's happening, where they live, where they work, where they... So that's what I think what helped this particular story re really resonate with our audience. Um, and on the large majority of these, these images, there is no kind of map data, there's no topographic data. Um, I think for Ordnance Survey, that's quite a brave move to say, you know, we're going to 
create these maps and these visualizations and kind of just let the data tell its own stories and kind of talk for, its, for itself just by using a couple of um, color techniques to help the colors blend so the darker the color, the more roots there are stacked on top of each other. But really simple visualizations that really, really hit home. So you can, you can see how it really pulls out that all the bridges crossing the Thames, you can see where people have left their GPS on, you know, on boats and stuff like that on the Thames. So there's lots and lots of individual personal stories that we're able to pull out of these very simple graphics. And we've run the same analysis over the last couple of years. And for anyone who's interested, Snowden is the most popular, and the summit of Snowden is the most walked patch of land, according to our data. Um, OS Custom Made, uh, this is another project we did a few years ago. Um, we have, a, we have a, an application on our website called OS Custom Made, where you can go in and order a site-centered map. Um, and again, this was a data set that is sat in our system somewhere, um, in our back end. And after about five years of having this application, we just kind of thought, wouldn't it be really interesting if we could get our hands on this data and see, see what we can do with it, really. So this, this, this was one that was driven by kind of us wanting to get our hands on this data and then through a process of visual analysis, actually finding the stories in the data, which we could then tell. So this was the data as it arrived to us. It was two humongous CSV files. Um, there are two map types that you can order. So they have one CSV per map type. I guess data like this is like really familiar with everyone. Um, I think there's 160 odd thousand rows. So there's absolutely no chance that anyone can make sense of this information. Um, so what have we got there? We've actually only got three columns. So we've got an X and a Y coordinate, so we know where that map was centered in Great Britain and we have a time so we know when that person ordered that map. So we've just kind of three dimensions really. So we've got a, a location, a time and we know the map type as well. Three different dimensions. We were then able to convert that CSV into geographic data using the coordinates. So on the left hand side we created a point for each map. So that's the centre point for each one. There's a pink and an orange then differentiating the two map types. We knew the size of each map, so we were able to convert that, that centre point into a square, which um, denotes the, the location of that, the extent of that map. <coughs> and as you can see, over yeah, like five years, um, I think the Lake District really sort of shone out as being one of the most popular. I'm assuming that's because lots of people are holidaying there and have great memories of their holidays in, in the lakes. So that was really popular. Uh, one thing you, we didn't know until we actually created that data and looked at it visually in a GIS was that there was only one part of um, Great Britain that hadn't actually fell on anybody's map. Only one part. And that was this remote island up in Shetland called Thula. So we thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting. And wouldn't it be great to complete the set? So. Um, Again, we worked with our media team on this, they, they went out and told a really nice story and they actually found, I think there was something around the region of 30 residential addresses on that island of Fula and they created a custom made map and sent one to each of those addresses. So we've now completed the whole of Great Britain with our custom made visualisation. But I really like this one as an example because we went into that, you know, we, these two CSVs landed in our email inbox. We didn't know what story we were going to find in that data but through just visual analysis, um, we were able to find this really cool thing. So that is a great example for me of how data visualization can help you, you know, find patterns and outliers and things like this. And then because we had these different elements, we had the time element of that data, we were able to do some, um, some animations over time. And then because we were showing it on a blog post with small images, trying to show 165,000 individual points, just looks a bit of a mess. It's really hard to see which areas of the country are the most popular. So we aggregated that data up into a hexagonal grid, and that's just a much clearer way to portray that exact same information. You can make sense of that and read that much more readily and easily. So on to OS Open Zoom Stack. Um, so ZoomStack is a new product that we um, developed and launched um, last year. It's a new base map for anyone 
just hands up actually, let me ask anybody who creates maps in their in their job. There's not one that says that may be useful. Um, so Open ZoomStack, as I say, it's a new open data product that we created. Um, looks a bit like this. Projector doesn't do it a um, great deal of justice, but it's a map that you can zoom all the way into street level detail and kind of zoom all the way back out to see a whole overview of, of Great Britain. Um, we created it because um, our customers, you know, they want detailed and up-to-date mapping of Great Britain, but lots of our open data products are actually um, were really difficult to use and we found that lots of our customers were spending an awful lot of time just managing the data before they could actually get to grips with it and start using it in anger. So, you know, we just, people just want to get started quickly, want to be more efficient and effective in their, in their job. So, this is our kind of push to try and create much more useful and usable content. Um, and we decided to launch as a trial, which is something that um, we've kind of seldom done in the past, but we want to work much more with our end users to ensure and validate that we're developing the right things, basically. So we made it from open data uh, into a really simple schema. It's nice and easy for us to understand and get to grips with. And we trialed various different um, formats. This is just one file, so you just download one file, whereas previously our users were having to download you know, hundreds, if not thousands of files. They'd have to unzip these different folders, deduplicate, probably chuck it all into a database. We've taken all that pain away by just saying have one file for the whole of Great Britain that allows you this, this really nice experience. So it can be a huge time saver and it's fully customizable. So it's designed for people to make their own data visualizations. Um, yeah, we had really good success with the trial. Uh, just helped really validate what we were doing, that we were doing the right things. Um, some really nice feedback coming in through social media and different platforms. Um, but what I kind of wanted to get through with talking about OS Open Zoom stack was that it showed, you know, for those of us in the room that are data collectors, you know, Ordnance Survey are a data collector and um, data provider, is that, you know, what we found with ZoomStack is that if we create the data in the right forms that are easy to use, that are familiar with people in the right formats, that it allows our end users to be much more efficient and effective in doing what they do. And we've seen some really good use cases of how people are um, using this new product. So Axis Maps um, are a company that are they're based in America and um, they've got one guy in England as well. Um, and we bumped into him at a conference last year and he said, you know what, I really want to start using Ordnance Survey data, but he was hitting all these barriers of it takes too long. You know, it hasn't, they hasn't, haven't got the time, it's one guy. Um, working by himself in this country, and he found that he just didn't have the time to do all that data management. So as soon as we launched ZoomStack, I'll let him know um, that we've done that during the trial, and he's like, hey Presto, this is in the exact right format for me, it's just one file, so it's super quick and easy to download, bring it into my mapping platform. And he took a day out of his work to create this really nice um, interactive web map, um, where he'd taken our base map, create his own custom style, is then able to overlay this data from land registry to show um, price paid um, for houses over a period of time. And then if you scroll down the left hand side, there's some really nice sort of filters you can filter down on that data. Um, and also the BBC. Uh, so the BBC were, during our trial period, really engaged with us, um, and their data journalists I've been using um, this new product quite a lot to tell stories of geographic data. Um, so the example on the left um, helps people compare rent affordability. And again, this is, you know, what they've done here is allow you to put in your postcode so it's showing data that's personal to you. Um, ZoomStack is the underlying um, map there, which they've gone on and reused uh, three or four times since. And they've also used it um, for creating static maps um, a different visualisation as we see there the Airbnb hotspot map. Um, and Esri UK, um, ZoomStack has enabled them to create a new suite of base maps. So anybody that, that ever you know, has been using Esri's technology, um, these base maps are kind of ready to use straight on the platform 
which has really helped their own cartographers um, get to this kind of end result a lot quicker and by removing a lot of that pain. And also we use um, this new product ourselves um, in-house for when we're creating lots of product demonstrators and, and interactive uh, web maps and different applications. I'll probably whiz through that, to be honest, but hopefully that gets the coffee and tea a lot quicker than we were expecting. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So if anyone has any questions for Charlie, um, any questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's Julia. Yeah. What's the relationship between Master Map and ZoomStack? Are, are they related at all, or is one derived from the other? Um, they're derived from the same source, ultimately, because we have one source of truth, one from which we derive everything. Master Map is very close to that, um, whereas ZoomStack is a lot more generalised, which is why it's free. <laughs> um, but we're currently, I don't know, we're doing open Master Map project. So the government, a couple of years ago, said that we're going to make large parts of Master Map freely available, or free at the point of use. So there's a huge project going on at the moment. Um, to make that happen, to make all the survey master map data freely available. Um, and a lot of what we've learned during that Zoom stack trial and engaging with our users, a lot of that learning has been taken into that master map project to make sure that ultimately our data is easy to use and accessible. Uh, thank you, that was really interesting also to see a bit more of the practical application. I have a very different question. How, how does one become a cartographer? Yeah, it's a, a really interesting question actually. I think there's like a ton of different ways to access geospatial and cartography. Um, I guess I can't talk for everyone, but I can talk my own personal um, journey into it. And I, I came at it from a design angle, so graphic design. Um, I didn't really, I was never really into geography in all honesty. Um, my stepdad had worked as a cartographer before, so that's that piqued my interest. I joined Ordnance Service as a trainee cartographer. So I've kind of learned everything I know about the more science side of things, like on the job that I've been able to bring those design principles um, yeah. to cartography. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to ask about sharing any maps you create using ZoomStack. Mm -hmm. Are you able to share it freely with others without yeah. any limits? Or? Yeah, no, so yeah. Um, Open ZoomStack is an open data product under the open government license, so it's all totally free and open and can be used for any purpose. Yeah. I've got a very naive question. So um, it seems to me that the whole world has been pretty exhaustively mapped. Mm. Is, is there any map making still to be done? Very good question, isn't it? <laughs> Are they? <laughs> and yeah, uh, absolute terms, because we can map absolutely everything in many, many different forms, I think. Um, there's that old stale quote, isn't there, that everything happens somewhere and that 80 odd percent of data has a location and we're creating more and more data all the time. So of course there's new information that we can be mapping, there's information about the world climate and the environment that of course we don't understand yet well enough. Um, so yeah, absolutely everything can be mapped. Yeah, I have a question related to, to because I'm, I'm interested in infrastructure mapping. So you're obviously mapping the natural world, so to speak. Are you aware of anybody embarking on a, on a, on a project to map a sort of in the world in 3D, so to speak, and, and also the built environment, not not just the sort of natural world? Yeah, I mean, so we're, we're involved in lots of projects looking at 3D, smart cities, uh, the internet thing, all these kind of buzzwords over the last few years. So we're looking at more and more three-dimensional data. Um, there are lots of organisations in that space doing that. Um, of course, you've got the, the British Geological Survey who map underground in 3D. Really incredible stuff. Um, there's a big project we're working on at the moment which, um, to look at underground asset. So in terms of physical in infrastructure that exists underground. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of stuff happening in that space for sure. Yeah. The smart cities is quite a big one. Yeah, there's lots of lots of um, large projects going on kind of all over the world to look at. Um, so 
modelling buildings internally and externally. And is there any conversation about data as part of that infrastructure in terms of um, sort of governance and meta model of how to actually represent um, yeah, those, certainly. Those, those assets? Yeah, I think Ordnance and Serna are playing a, a key role in quite a few of those from that side of things, making sure that the data is right, that the data can be shared easily, data standards, all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Not something I work on directly, so I can't give. Well, it's happening. Oh, it is happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a big space. It also, uh, it also works still for funny young photographers. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you. We've got a 15 minute pause for the afternoon break, and then uh, one more.